Tony Stark has been through a lot, and now it's time to reinvent himself. Welcome to Comic Storian, where we take trade paperbacks and single issues and break them down into digestible bites before reading them back to you in dramatic fashion. And today, I am going to be covering the first three issues of Christopher Cantwell's Iron Man. And if you guys enjoy these types of videos, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon to make sure that notifications are on so that you're aware when new videos go live. But anyway, enough of that, let's dive on in. The window of the store shatters outwards as Iron Man flies Terax through it. He flies him up into the sky, only half paying attention as he orders Boss, his AI, to sell off all of his stock in Stark Unlimited. Who are you even talking to? Terax asks, just as Tony flies him through a satellite into space. Later that night, Tony is checking Twitter to find out that a lot of people are upset that he knocked out their internet and satellite TV. Seriously? Tony asks as he glances at his phone. Now that Tony is back, he's trying once again to find who he is. Selling his stocks, his home, his vast cars, and collection of Iron Man suits. He moves to New York, where he buys a large brownstone and moves in. But he looks around at his barely furnished apartment and sighs. He walks over to the window, where he discovers Janet Van Dyne hovering outside. Nice place. I just wanted to tell you face to face that I've moved on. I think it's what's best, she tells him. Tony nods, I agree, and tells her to take care. That night, he takes his new car, a 1978 Dodge Aspen, to Amsterdam Avenue, hoping to open it up and race a little. Where do I put my name in? He asks as he pulls up. But the racers aren't having it, thinking he's a cop. I'm not a cop. I'm just a dumb rich guy with five grand to lose. He says. The racer cocks an eyebrow and looks over his shoulder. Somebody get Halcyon over here. Tell him he's got a heat. The racer shouts. Tony waits as Halcyon walks up. Hi, Tony says. But the others laugh and tell him that Halcyon's deaf. Halcyon smiles and makes a sign, but Tony doesn't understand. He says to get ready to see taillights. The other racers inform him. The race begins and is over in only a matter of moments. With Tony trying his hardest to pull ahead, but Halcyon barely reacts and races fast and cool. Kid's ice cold, Tony notes afterwards as Halcyon counts his money. Doesn't even flinch. You ever want to waste another five grand? We'd be glad to have you back, the other racers say. That night, Tony has a gathering of rich people at his apartment. Witter isn't happy, and Tony has to move through his own guests, trying to avoid everyone asking him for donations or investments. He pushes through until he pauses as he sees an old friend. Gosh, if they could touch the hem of Tony Stark's garment, Patsy Walker says with a smile. They talk for a moment, with Patsy asking what is going on with Tony, reminding him that I'm one of the ones who knew you when you were just a guy with a neat metal suit, she tells him. Maybe I'm just trying to be that guy again, he explains to her. But the two are interrupted by another, Fuller Tylerd, a scientist who tells Tony that he is working on a sustainable energy source that could change the world. Tony pauses for a moment, before asking the man to go on. Fuller tells Tony that he has perfected lightning capture and asks him to call about it later. Anyway, you wanted to show me something? Patsy asks as the pair turns away from Fuller. Tony leads her down into the garage, where he shows her the classic Iron Man armor that he has created. Well, what do you think? He asks after putting it on. She smiles at him. Are you kidding? I love vintage clothing, she says. He suggests that they ditch the party and head out for a superhero team-up. What about your guests? Patsy asks. Tony looks at her and explains that he set an EMP to go off in his building and fry all of their electronics. Ah, now I understand the invite list, she says with a smile. So the two head out into the city. While standing atop one of New York's tall buildings, Tony explains to Patsy that he's trying to find himself 
trying to figure out who he is. Maybe you need to be no one at all, she suggests. Explaining to him that his new humility is just his ego in different clothing. But their talk is interrupted as they both notice a helicopter on top of a nearby library. As they go to check it out, they are surprised to find the unicorn escaping the building with a stolen book. That looks like a reference text. I don't think you can check that out, Tony tells him as he and Patsy appear before a unicorn. The criminal doesn't hesitate. I only serve the other, he shouts before lashing out at Tony. Does the other not have his own library card? Tony asks as he fires a beam. Hellcat moves in to punch Unicorn in the face, but the criminal turns and blasts her with energy. Tony grabs Unicorn from behind, but is hit with another shockwave of energy that throws him away. The criminal boards his helicopter and begins to fly away. But Tony leaps into the air and flies through the propeller, downing the chopper into the street below. As Unicorn crawls from the wreckage, he is still struggling to hold on to the book. Tony takes it from his hands and opens it. It's a Gutenberg Bible, Tony says with surprise. Unicorn looks up at him. The other will seek vengeance upon you, he begins to say, but Hellcat is there and kicks him in the face. She stands over the unconscious villain, surprised by his holy speech. You think he's really hearing things or just nuts? She asks. Tony shakes his head, telling her that Bellevue will have to figure it out. Elsewhere, Dr. Fuller stares out the window into the night. One year ago, the new android that would become Fuller Tylerd was awakened by Dr. Zoda. Please, call me by my real name. Korvac, the android says. Zoda created the android to aid the Enclave, but Korvac has no interest in this. I have bigger plans, and I must begin immediately. Korvac says as he walks from the room. Present day, Iron Man is thrown back against the ropes as Carl Creel rushes forward and grabs him, throwing him to the ground. The two of them have been captured by Arcade and are being forced to fight for the internet's sick amusement. Sorry, man, but if taking you out gets me home to my wife, Titania, I gotta do it, Creel says as he leans in. No worries. Though, maybe we should consider a different way to handle, Tony begins to say, but Creel grabs him again and throws him across the ring. Iron Man lands and hits him with a laser blast before flying into him. The two continue to fight around the ring, and Tony is knocked down. The ref steps up and begins to count, with Tony realizing that Arcade would be close by to watch the action. He whirls and grabs the ref by the shirt, reaching up and ripping away his mask to reveal Arcade's smiling face. Later, Tony is sitting on the floor of his brownstone, complaining to Patsy about how the internet thinks he only ended the fight because he was gonna lose. Tony, why does that even matter? Patsy asks him. Tony has to think about it for a moment before answering. It doesn't, but I mean, he begins to say, but she stops him and tries to lead him through a Zen meditation breathing exercise, where he's supposed to calm his mind and not think about anything but breathing. But Tony can't get the hang of it, and finally just stops. Creel was the bad guy, why does everyone root for the bad guy now? Tony asks her as he paces the room. She finally asks him, what is he trying to prove? That I'm still a hero, he tells her. Who do you need to prove that to? She asks. Tony looks out the window, trying to think of an answer. But the Iron Man helmet begins to beep from the bed. He puts on the helmet to answer the call, learning that six pharmaceutical scientists were kidnapped by Cardiac. He explains it to Patsy quickly. He said he's going to kill them because of Tony Stark, of course. I could use your help. Tony blasts across the city, approaching Cardiac fast and blasting him with repulsor beams. The criminal stands before a massive black orb. I've got him, seems very supervillain, Tony reports to Patsy. Is this all because I support Big Pharma? Tony asks as he blasts Cardiac again. With Cardiac down, Tony scans the orb and learns that the scientists are trapped inside and will die of asphyxiation in four minutes. Tony tries to blast the orb 
but it does nothing. They have to die, Stark. A message has to be sent. Our healthcare system is a crime, Cardiac says as he struggles to his feet, but Hellcat leaps up behind him and kicks him down. Tony flies away, knowing that he only has one choice. Boss, is this far enough back? He asks. The AI confirms that Tony will be able to reach maximum suit velocity, but then begins to list off the probable injuries from hitting the orb at full speed. But Tony doesn't listen and rockets forward, punching at the orb with full speed and breaking it open. He hangs there. The arm of his suit mangled as he gasps for air. Am I dying? Am, am I dead? He gasps to Patsy. Later, Patsy sits with Tony in the hospital, yelling at him for his reckless behavior and realizing that he is trying to kill himself in a heroic fashion so that his life will be simpler. But their argument is interrupted as the alarms begin to ring through the hospital. Hellcat walks forward to find that the unicorn has broken free. She rounds a corner to have him punch her in the face and knock her to the ground. I am a servant of our true god! I hear him everywhere! He calls me on the electricity! Unicorn shouts as he stands over her. Later, 42 miles outside of Canaan, Oklahoma, Unicorn runs through the plains as a storm rages above. It's me! I'm here! I come to serve! He shouts to the sky. Lightning crashes from the sky and strikes him. In New York, Iron Man hovers over the city that he has chosen to call his home. He flies down and gets to work, finding criminals and saving the day. He tries to be a hero of the people, at one point landing amongst a group of school kids to hang out. But the teachers come out telling Iron Man that he is disrupting the kids' learning and that he shouldn't be doing this. And with a sigh of frustration, Tony flies away. That night, he returns to the brownstone to find the melter has broken into his garage and melted his new car. I melted your car, the melter says with a smile. I can see that, Tony responds. He walks forward and knocks the melter out. Picking up the criminal's body, he flies him out of the building and high up into the air. For a moment, he looks around the city before dropping the melter, who begins to plummet to the ground below. Tony watches him for a moment, wondering if the villains and criminals realize that the heroes could kill them at any time, but don't, that they choose to follow the rules of society. Finally, Tony blasts down and catches the melter before he can hit the ground. Later, Tony and Patsy have flown out to the Tyler Lightning site, where Tony has decided to invest in Fuller's work. Tony arrives in his Iron Man armor and is greeted by Dr. Tyler as he comes out. Mr. Stark, welcome! I was worried you were going to miss the fireworks. Didn't know you were going to show up in full accoutrement, Fuller says in a greeting. Tony floats in front of him. Apologies, Fuller. The suit will afford me a closer look at my investment without getting fried. After Tyler gives Tony some of the specs on his devices, Tony leaps into the air and begins to inspect it, and the storm begins to rage overhead. Tony looks at the lightning rods, noting that the Stark logo has been covered. Does the Stark name embarrass you that much? Tony asks Fuller over the radio. There's a momentary pause. Well, as much as I appreciate your financial support over these months, unfortunately, our partnership has to end here, Fuller says. And Tony is confused. I can't have this traced back to me, Fuller continues. A bolt of lightning crashes from the sky and slams into Tony's back, knocking him into the ground where he bounces along the earth. He struggles to look up, his suit already malfunctioning. Apologies, Tony. You're a good man, but my disciples and I have a higher purpose, Fuller says, now surrounded by three supervillains. With the power I'll pull from this planet, I'll become a demigod. But being a demigod is just a means to an end. I plan to be a god. 
Fuller says. But Patsy suddenly comes flying out of the storm in a jeep, slamming it into the collection of villains. God, I hate men pontificating in the rain, she shouts. She jumps out and helps Tony to his feet. I told you this was a bad investment, Tony gasps. He whirls and fires a blast at Controller. Good to see you haven't been moisturizing, Tony jokes as Hellcat whirls and kicks Blizzard. The fight continues until Fuller reappears, hitting both heroes with a blast of electricity that throws them both to the ground. Both heroes don't move and the villains disappear. The suit restarts Tony's heart and he struggles to his feet, pulling Patsy's body to him and cradling it in his arms. It's all my fault. Again, he says. And that brings us to the conclusion of the first three issues of the Iron Man Big Iron story arc. If you guys enjoyed this, and I really hope you did, please be sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, make sure you hit that bell icon just to make sure you get notifications for when all videos go live, and it really helps the channel. Plus, be sure to leave a comment down below. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching, and I will see you next time with the next installment of Iron Man.